Good afternoon, Coach Slack here once again, continuing our readings on the ascetical homilies of St. Isaac the Syrian. We're going to get into homily 14 here. It's a two-page homily. We'll do the first page today, page 201, subtitled, Concerning Hezekast, on when they begin to understand what place they have attained with their labors in the boundless sea that is the life of stillness and on when they can have a little hope that their toils have begun to yield them fruit. I shall tell you something, and do not laugh, for I speak the truth. Neither doubt my words, for they who have handed them down to me are true. Though you should suspend yourself by your eyelids before God, do not think you have attained to anything by the manner of life which you lead until you have attained to tears. For until then, your hidden self is in the service of the world, that is, you are leading the life of those who dwell in the world and do the work of God with the outward man. But the inward man is still without fruit, for his fruit begins with tears. When you attain to the region of tears, then know that your mind has left the prison of this world and has set its foot on the journey to the new age, and has begun to breathe that other air, new and wonderful, and at the same moment it begins to shed tears, since the birth pangs of the spiritual infant are at hand. For grace, the common mother of all, makes haste mystically to give birth in the soul to the divine image for the light of the age to come. But when the time of its delivery is arrived, simultaneously the mind begins to be stirred by something of that other age, just like the subtle breath the babe draws inside the body wherein it is nurtured. And since the mind cannot bear what is not usual for it, it suddenly begins to set the body to wail, a wailing mingled with the sweetness of honey. And as much as the inward babe is raised, by just so much is there an increase in tears. But this order of tears, the one of which I am speaking, is not the one that also at intervals comes over Hezekast, because this consolation, which appears from time to time, is every man's who dwells in the stillness with God. Sometimes it comes to him when he finds himself in the divine vision of his mind, and sometimes through the words of the scriptures, and sometimes in the converse of prayer. But I am speaking rather of that order which belongs to him who sheds tears unceasingly, both night and day. So uh, let's go through this a little bit. So it starts off in a subtitle concerning Hezekast. So, uh, Hezekiah, as we know, St. Joseph the Hezekiah, uh, as one example, um, are people that practice stillness, right? Not just stillness in body, because obviously they're active uh, a lot, but more so um, uh, st still the stillness of the inward self, number one, but also... Uh, quieting, filtering out the world from reaching the inner depths of their heart, right? Uh, so then thereby allowing that inner depth to be connected with God and to allow, you know, let's, you know, I often talk about heart and mind, right? So if we're filtering it, the world from getting to our heart, we're also clearing our mind to be able to contemplate and discern uh, God's will uh, in our own lives and, um, uh, and, and where we find ourselves in that community of people who are along the path of the way. So he says, concerning Hezekiah, on which they begin to understand what place they have attained with their labors. So labors being, you know, the struggles on that way. So prayer, uh, attending services, um, the mysteries that God presents to us in the boundless sea that is the life of stillness. And on which they can have a little hope that their toils have begun to yield them fruit. And so, like anything, uh, I used to tell my students all the time, anything worth attaining is not going to come easy. It's going to come with time and lots of struggle and consistent struggle, right? And so, these toils in the spiritual life, uh, I, th I would say, are uh, even a multiplication of that, right? And so the fruit that yields, so let's just use the gardening 
Uh, some of you see my gardening vis uh, videos. And so using that, it's like, you know, we till the soil, we prepare the soil, we plant the seeds, we water, we allow them to have sun, we prune them, all these labors, right? And then eventually, uh, you know, after 60 days, 90 days, 180 days, depending on the type of vegetable or fruit we're growing, then we start to see uh, the plants yielding the fruit. And so how much more so uh, when we're toiling with our spiritual edification, right, our nurturing of our soul um, along the path to theosis and salvation, right? It's a lifetime. It never ends. Not just 60, 90, 180 days, not just a growing season, but literally our entire earthly life. And so he says, I shall teach you something and do not laugh for I speak the truth. Neither doubt my words, for they who have handed them down to me are true. So here he reveals some things, right? Number one, that um, there's truth, right? There's reality. And the wisest people that I've read, like St. Isaac here, or, or met maybe some of the blessed elders that I've been able to uh, sit with and pray with in, in different places, they're seeking the truth, right? They're, they're, they're seeking to, uh, every day of their lives, live in the reality of truth. And uh, this makes me think of something. So uh, in the Bible, when we're hearing about Pontius Pilate, and he says to Jesus, what is truth? And then I heard an elder one time explain that he asked the wrong question. He should have asked, who is the truth? Because Christ is the truth, right? The logos, the word. He says, I am the truth. I am the way, right? So he's speaking about this, the truth, Christ, the logos. And then the other thing St. Isaac reveals here is these aren't a lot of times his own words. They've been handed down to him. And for they who have handed them down to me are true. Okay, so who is this, right? Uh, it's his connecting to God. It could be other people, maybe his elders, maybe uh, people that taught him as he was uh, growing in his own spirituality, his own journey. But also, I think more so here, he's talking about conversing with God through his prayer life, through participating in the mysteries, the liturgies, um, the vigils, these types of things. So he says, I speak the truth, for they who have handed them down to me are true. So again, what is truth? Wrong question. Who is truth? Christ. Through, though you should suspend yourself by the eyelids before God, do not think you have attained to anything by the manner of life which you lead on, until you have attained to tears. So again, um, this reminds me as I often quote um, James, right? Uh, faith and works, right? It's not just going to be our works because he's saying here, even if you should suspend yourself by your eyelids, you know, if you think that this is some sort of sacrifice before God, do not think you have attained anything by the manner of life which you lead until you have attained to tears. So what are we talking about? Compunction, right? Compassion, empathy, um, love, pure love, right? Which is God, referring to John. God is love. Love is God. Without God, there would be nothing. For until then, your hidden self is in the service of the world. That is, you are leading the life of those who dwell in the world and do the work of God with the outward man. And so I, I would uh, venture to say that this is a long process, right? Separating ourselves from the world. Um, and until we attain this compunction, right? Uh, these tears. And I've seen this. I've witnessed this. And oftentimes... I kind of get upset at myself because I don't think I've attained this. I mean, there's been moments where I felt the grace of God or the mercy of God, or I've been so broken and been in such a deep struggle that a God has allowed. Maybe I've hit rock bottom where I've attained tears. But I've seen uh, elders and archimandrites and, and priests and, and just in general good people um, out there who are just moved to tears at empathy or compassion or love for others, right, or love of God and these types of things, and um, not to use the word jealous, but um, it kind of pains my heart, and, um, you know, I ask myself sometimes, you know, um, how can I reach this level of, of uh, spirituality, of being, of existence, right, but the inward man is still without fruit. 
for his fruit begins with tears. And so until we've attained this, we're really, you know, you know, I, you know like um, Jesus said, beware of those who stand in the front row and pray loudly and in front of everyone and, and have the long phylacteries or, uh, and these types of things. So we got to be careful that it's just not outwardly, we're robotically or mechanically going through the motions, right? But we have to reach the depths, our own depths, the inward man, right? To, to, to allow this compunction, you know, um, at our baptism, I'll say at our creation, at our conception, and then especially at our baptism, you know, that seed of God is in our heart. And that's what we're trying to, 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 to nurture and water, right? And let grow and let that fruit, the inward man, right? Uh, the seed that God has planted in our innermost heart. When you attain to the region of tears, then know that your mind has left the prison of this world and has set its foot on the journey to the new age and has begun to breathe that other air, new and wonderful. And so in the world, but not of the world, right? So what I think St. Isaac here is explaining is like when we hit that level of compunction and that level of love and spirituality deep within us, then let us, he says, then know that your mind has left the prison of this world. Right. If we're still getting upset, which, you know, obviously I'm very guilty of about things in the world, these temporal things, then then we should know that that's a sign that our mind is in that prison of this world. Right. If it's still affecting us, um, not to say that all of us are not human and that we're not going to have emotions and these types of things. Um, it's not that because even Jesus wept. Right. We, we, we saw that uh, when Lazarus dies, he, he wept. Right. Um, he was fully God, fully human. So he gives us examples not only of the perfection of God um, in a tangible way, but also what it means to be human in the best sense of the word. And at the same moment, it begins to shed tears since the birth pangs of the spiritual infant are at hand. So when we attain the several tears, it's like we're still just an infant, right? Uh, along the journey of Christ to Christ. For grace, the common mother of all, makes taste mystically to give birth in the soul to the divine image of the light of the age to come. And so it is at this point when we become an infant um, along the journey to theosis that we even begin to glimpse, uh, even if it's just a reflection or um, uh, in mirrors, let's just say, or just uh, experiencing the energies and the essence of the age to come, the light of the age to come, paradise, right? And another thing I really love about when I'm thinking about paradise or heaven or these types of things, it's not necessarily a place, but again, it's a person. And who is that person? Christ. But when the time of its delivery has arrived, simultaneously the mind begins to be stirred by something of that other age, right? Just like the New Jerusalem, right? Not the current Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, the eternal Jerusalem. Just like the subtle breath the babe draws inside the body wherein it is nurtured. And since the mind cannot bear what is not usual for it, it suddenly begins to set the body to well, a welling mingled with the sweetness of honey. And so when we taste this grace and this mercy um, of that sort, right, um, of truth, right, when God allows these moments of grace and mercy, you know, the body's not used to it, right? We're used to being in the world, battered, letting our emotions be directed and these types of things by our worldly experiences. And when we start to experience the next age's essence and energy, it can only, um, it sets the body to welling, as he says here. And since the mind cannot bear what is not usual for it. So that's what we're saying. And as much as the inward babe is raised by just so much is there an increase in tears. And as we taste this and feed into this and increase um, in that direction, then so do the tears. But this order of tears, the one of which I am speaking, is not the one that also at intervals comes over Hezekiah. Because this consolation, which appears from time to time, is every man's who dwells in stillness with God. And so where will we find this type of compunction in these tears? When we quiet the outside world, go internally and connect to God, right? Sometimes it comes in when he finds himself in the divine vision of his mind, and sometimes through the words of the scriptures, and sometimes in the converse of prayer. So now uh, St. Isaac is giving us the tools, right? 
um, to work on ourselves, our inward man. Right? Um, sometimes these, this compunction, these tears come when he finds himself in divine visions, uh, which I'm sure is reserved for uh, those a lot further along the path than I am. And sometimes through the words of Scripture. So here's some of the tools that any of us can uh, utilize. And perhaps that leads to, to the divine visions, right? Uh, scripture every day. And sometimes in the converse of prayer. So prayer and scriptures are the tool that Christ taught us, that God gives us, that we can attain um, what he's talking about here, tears. But I am speaking rather of that order which belongs to him who sheds tears unceasingly both day and night. And so here we have uh, what we're all called to attain a holiness, right? If, if, if someone is shedding tears unceasingly both day and night, not in a, a sad way, but with just supreme compunction, realizing the grace and mercy and the love for which God has for us, it's an overwhelming emotion, and they're giving that back, reciprocating that love with their tears. So anyhow, I'm just trying to get back into these readings. You know, uh, if you've been following some of the other videos, I, you know, I've been... You know, busy. We have the house in uh, Western Florida that was affected by a couple hurricanes there, so I was in and out of that, and then coming back, preparing for winter here, and uh, just different things that I get busy with. But we all get busy, so there's no excuses. But just trying to get back into the flow, get back into the mindset. Uh, um, you know, I'm one that does well with routines, and so my re reading routines are also like that. You know, waking up, reading. Uh, the Epistle, the Gospel, the Saints of the Day, of course, St. Isaac, sometimes St. Paisios, and the other readings I get into. Uh, when I'm getting into a consistent flow of this, and I start to feel myself, um, you know, just more wholesome, right? Um, and, and, you know, hopefully with the goal of becoming uh, more holy, right? Uh, bettering myself, which is what God wants for me and wants for all of us. And so this is the uh, goal. All right, and so uh, my goal is St. Isaac was saying here, scripture is converse and prayer, reading of the saints, these types of things, like my spiritual father tells me, are what nurture. If we want our prayers to be answered, we have to give some sort of struggle to God. Reading scriptures, praying, complines, uh, prayer rules, these types of things, participating in the mysteries of uh, God within the context of the church, and uh, all anything else, you know. But anyhow. I don't want to ramble or digress, but it's good to be back in the flow here. And uh, please keep your comments coming. They help uh, encourage me, and uh, hopefully we can get a little bit more consistent again heading into uh, the late fall here. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen.